I'm really humbled by that introduction by Dr. Kalra sir. I think we have stalwarts here, Dr. Patwardhan sir, even my mentor, Dr. Kalra sir, uh, and uh, Ame of course has been a, a colleague and a participant of my journey through mind body medicine. And I thank the Endocrine Society, the West Zone, as well as the Central Endocrine Society and Maharashtra Endocrine Society. for giving me this opportunity to present something which i think is novel to all of us as endocrinologists probably psychiatrists know much about it but uh, this field has fascinated me and i think it should be stimulating all of us in future so i'll be uh, just taking through the perspective of a neuroendocrinologist point of view as far as behavioral endocrinology is considered so uh, this whole journey of behavioral endocrinology understanding began in the lockdown period when we had lot of discussions on the whatsapp group and uh, there was a, a question laid by on the common endocrine group saying that what would you do if you were not an endocrinologist and people said they would either be neurologists or psychiatrists so i was wondering why would an endocrine feel like being a neuro or a psychiatry not any other specialty like a cardiology or whatever and then i just thought let's look at what uh, what hormones have to do with brain and behavior really and that is how the whole journey began and i found this book and this is an amazing book and that led to the search of all this uh, topics in future so i just uh, cover this uh, topic in sp short span of time that i have so behavioral endocrinology is a branch of endocrinology which studies the effect of neuroendocrine system and its effect on behavior and it is actually a integration of three fields it's psychology endocrinology and ethology put together so it's a combination mix and i think it's the right topic on this forum where we are talking about interdisciplinary uh, connections now this interaction between hormones and behavior is bidirectional so neuroendocrine system are, is known to affect the behavior and this behavior is known to give a feedback to the neuroendocrine system and hormone concentrations so how do these hormones really work they work like like any other hormone where they act as chemical messengers and they have a sensory aspect a central integrator aspect and a peripheral effect to muscle but what is different here is that these hormones these the hormones related to behavior are also generated by the brain for specific function and this is the beauty of the whole field that the brain has a capacity for what we call as a adaptive plasticity and that i think is a amazing concept that you can really change your brain if you want to through these chemicals and how do you affect this is through behavioral interventions so for example hormone actions are known to integrate in one common area of the brain called as hippocampus which is now known to be a integrating part of the brain what integrates the hormones behavior and the brain together is the hippocampus so what has been found is that if this integration is lost it leads to mood disorders so sometimes the person is depressed irritable and you see this happening at menopause you see this happening with age with time and i think this is a concept which we have not really exploited to the maximum to improve the adaptive plasticity of the brain with time so what is the function of the neuroendocrine system if you see in terms of uh, the feelings that a human being has so when i feel low when i feel a low sugar when i feel a low blood pressure when i feel a hot temperature or when i feel breathless or when i feel stressed all that feeling comes through this neuroendocrine system so you see that it regulates metabolism through the hpa axis it regulates physiology through the thyroid and through the hp axis what we probably don't know is that many of our anxious patients also feel breathless because the lungs also have a neuroendocrine cell which is called as the pne cell and that senses that hypoxia so it is a feeling of hypoxia it may not be actual hypoxia and then regulatory behavior so stress and it's uh, the gender related differences that we are coming across it's not only that sex matters it is really that the gonadal axis changes the way a person thinks so all this is known to be a, a new you can say a pandora's box for every one of us to investigate and explore for ourselves as to what we can find in this so what are the components of this system so you have neurons you have endocrine glands you have neuroendocrine tissues then the hormones and most importantly the neurochemicals so funniest part is that being a endocrinologist for so many years i never realized that the smallest neuroendocrine organ is a neuroendocrine cell 
and uh, the largest one is what we really focus on which is a hypothalamo pituitary axis that we are seeing so uh, what we see in the bargain is that we tend to forget the smallest organ and you see that the adrenal medullary cell which is responsible for the stress hormones the apert cells which are responsible for so called gut feeling that we have the gut related issues and the many more in the intestine in the various uh, organs and uh, to be very exact every organ has a neuroendocrine cell so we are forgetting all these neuroendocrine organs when we are talking of only endocrine at large so where does this integration occur as i said it occurs in the hippocampus and this is what gives the concept of adaptive neuroplasticity i'll come to that so the basis of uh, behavioral endocrinology comes from a concept in neurobiology which tells that uh, non endocrine behavioral effects of hormones can be modulated as the nervous system matures so there is a change people say that brains don't change with age but there is a change which occurs with change of hormones and how do this occur because there are mechanisms which help uh, the operation of this so hormones act by two ways either they act as with the epigenetic factors or through the plasticity and it is through the organizing effect so organizing means uh, we all know simple example that we all know is that the male hormone in the utero acts on the brain of the fetus and gives rise to a male organizational structure of the brain and this is activated at the time of puberty so you have a period when there is a suppression and then there is a activation so every hormone not only the sex hormone has this kind of an effect so organizational effect on the brain of a fetus is a effect of all the hormones and then there is a process in life when activation starts probably it is more timed at puberty but if you see every phase of life of a child is known to have this activation so different hormones will give rise to different organizational effects and activational effects so various axes have been involved we know all the axes we know the hp axis we know the gonadal axis what we probably don't know is the diffuse neuroimmune endocrine system which exists so we know that hematology is affected immunology is affected and endocrinology is affected when the mind is affected so this is the basis of your mind body medicine therapy that Uh, you are changing these axes by and if you see that the most of our patients with anxiety or stress are prone for asthma for allergies for itching so all the skin related immuno endocrinology is involved so i think there is a lot of work to be done to identify neuroendocrine dysfunctions in different organs so that we can actually unfold what happens to patients with uh, psychologic disorders so what are the hormones which really influence behavior of a person so wh- why are we the way we are is the question so the neurotransmitters like dopamine serotonin endorphin are the key uh, uh, what you can say mind body hormones in terms of uh, what they make you and what they make you feel then you know of sex hormones which is known to us then you know of cortisol and what we really don't know is hormones like oxytocin thyroxin vasopressin prolactin and leptin also play an important role on behavior your eating behaviors your sleeping behaviors your drinking behaviors water behaviors thoughts behaviors all your behaviors are dependent on these hormones so this is a very interesting uh, reference i got uh, that i thought that the gut feeling was just a layman terminology but gut feeling is a feeling it's a feeling which comes through microbiome brain immune interactions which is known to affect the uh, affect social and affective behavior and i think that word has come through that the gut feeling my gut tells me that and you see that lot of gut disturbances are there in our patients we uh, usually tend to treat uh, symptomatically or we tend to refer to our gastro colleagues but i think there's a time that we also start looking into it seriously now how how hormones affect behavior is one question that we always have and uh, hormones are not per se actual causative change the uh, uh, actions for behavior actually they are known to influence these three systems which i told you that the sensory system the integrated system and the output so it's just a simple example in a rodent say uh, estrogen in a rodent is known to be stimulated by tactile stimuli of a male and this is known to produce some neuronal stimulation through integration this is known to actually help in synthesizing proteins and rna to help neuromuscular activity increase 
and give more chemosensory attractants to attract a male. So you can see that simple hormone like estrogen is easy to exemplify because these are sexual behaviors which are basic behaviors. But such kind of complexity exists with each and every hormone and we need to assess what each hormone does in all these three aspects. Now, this is a very uh, actually elaborate style slide which I have tried to condense. But it was very surprising for me to understand that unethical behavior, cheating behavior and infidelity are related to high testosterone and cortisol in human beings. Then dopamine is related to all the addictions and pleasure related reward systems, the endorphin and uh, dopamine system. So especially in patients with uh, Parkinsonism and in patients who have lost these there is a lack of pleasure and sadness comes into picture when these axes are involved. Similarly, uh, testosterone is known to be an aggression hormone, which also inhibits crying. So a person doesn't cry if he has a high testosterone. That's a very surprising thing. Then there are certain hormones or metabolites of hormones, which are known to elevate moods in women and men separately. So there are certain chemosensory cues even in uh, human beings. So this is also very surprising that prolactin rise is associated with crying behavior. So you see that patients with uh, hyperprolactinemia are more prone for having crying spells and depressive episodes. So a lot of hormones are linked with behavior. And the commonest hormones that we know of is oxytocin, which is a love, trust and attraction hormone and melatonin, which is related to sleep behavior. So I think we need to know these hormones in the depth of their uh, presentation and each hormone is a topic by itself and can be discussed separately. Now, how does behavior affect hormones? So you can see that when there are chemosensory cues, there are certain smells which stimulates the production of estradiol. And this estradiol is in turn known to affect the behavior to seek male attention or uh, behaviors in that aspect. So this occurs in a vice versa fashion also. When male behaviors are there, there is more production of chemosensory cues. Similarly, in human males, there have been studies which showed that all the winners, the winners are known to have high testosterone levels, whether it is a male winner or a female winner, but losers are known to be having low testosterone level because uh, that rewarding system is known to have an impact on the hormone. Similarly, crying for long spells in human beings is known to be associated with excess oxytocin and endorphin, which in turn makes the brain numb to all the blunt feelings and the hurting feelings. And then the man recovers from the grief or the sorrow. So these are important uh, phenomena that uh, we need to understand. There are a lot of studies being done. And in fact, I'm glad to be associated with the Niemann's group and they're doing a lot of studies on functional MRI in patients with abnormal behaviors. But there is a lot of uh, research going on in gene manipulations and gene arrays, how uh, depressive moods can be changed and how hormone behavior interaction can be improved. So where is the role of behavioral endocrinology then in our practice? So we know that uh, we are seeing a lot of neuropsychiatric and neurodegenerative and non-communicable diseases, especially when diabetes comes into picture. We're seeing a lot of gender differences and dimorphic behaviors as compared to uh, male and female sexes in all diseases. It's not only in uh, diabetes, it's seen in endocrine, in cardiology, in gastroenterology and many more. Then stress and stress interactions have known to be associated with health and disease. Health across the lifespan, right from puberty and adulthood, as I said, that uh, plasticity is a phenomenon which keeps on changing. And what uh, mind-body therapies actually do is change this neuroplasticity and make you more adaptable to it. So, uh, of course, there are a lot of uh, data on microbiota and neuroendocrine interactions the neuroimmune interactions and then neuroendocrine control is what is not really known. So we are learning more and more in glucose homeostasis where the brain controls the glucose levels, but probably a lot of things need to be still known. So just uh, before I end, I would uh, discuss some behaviors, uh, the common hormone uh, behavior interactions. So aggressive behaviors, uh, it has been found that those uh, fetuses who are 
uh, prenatally exposed to androgens. So even for that matter, girls with uh, CH or males who have been uh, uh, exposed to androgens prenatally have a wiring of the brain in that fashion. And that's why they are more prone for rage at aggressiveness at puberty because there is activation of this, of this organizational effect. Even when we give anabolic steroids, there is a, something called as roid rage which comes in because of that. And why men tend to be more aggressive is probably for the same reason. Then coming to the dimorphic sex behavior. So it is not only the sexual behavior, but the differences in the disease manifestations. It would be dependent based on that. And uh, this is classically exemplified that girls with CH tend to be more masculine in their choices. So they, they play with more of male toys and uh, they are likely to have more of male-like behaviors. And uh, then these organizational effect of these hormones then show its, uh, you can say, actual form at the time of puberty. And of course, there are, because of this, suppose uh, the male has more muscular mass, then there is a chance that that, uh, that male child will be given a heavy job than the female child. And eventually this has led to cultural beliefs and practices. And that also has an impact on the, how the child grows as a adult male and female. So uh, why we say that females should be doing this and males should be doing this is probably because of these choices which have made the physiology in that fashion. So the maternal behavior is a third kind of behavior. So it has been found that high maternal cortisol level is known to be associated with more affectionate behavior, more possessiveness, more positive maternal attitude and vice versa. If they have low cortisol, they tend to reject their babies. They, need, they tend to be more detached to the babies. They have less of affectionate behaviors. And I think that's a surprising fact. There has been studies in uh, postpartum women uh, who had low cortisol and they've been found that they were not attached to their children in future. So I think that's a wonderful uh, insight that we get from this whole concept. Uh, there are huge research areas which are open for this and it, uh, it covers area from flu food to fluid intake and social interactions, soul balance, learning and memory, stress coping, anxiety disorders, eating disorders. Most of these are important as far as diabetes goes. So I really, I, I just got a thought that maybe probably it's a time to shift our base. So we know that diabetes, we talk of treating in this fashion, but is it a time to actually think of hormones, behavior and epigenetic much before you think of why they are not following your diet, why they are not for adhering to your regimen? So is it a time for a behavioral intervention before you actually try treating your diabetic patients so that probably, and at least talk to our patients that you need a behavior change so that you can have, make your brain more adaptable to whatever I'm telling you. So uh, that's a thought just to give about. So to summarize, the brain and body communicate reciprocally via hormones and via neurochemical mediators. They impact the body and brain both positively and negatively. The dimorphic sex differences affect whole brain via both genetic and epigenetic mechanism. Early life experiences in utero and transgenerational effects have lasting effects on gene expression, affecting the adaptive plasticity of a person. And knowledge of behavioral endocrinology makes it possible to design correct therapeutic strategies and understanding the potentialities and limitations of our patients. And actually behavioral endocrinology, I think, gives a hope that interventions throughout life can ameliorate the negative effects by reactivating the plasticity, the epigenetic activity and produce positive consequences for our body in health and disease. And that is what uh, behavioral interventions has to talk about. And I, uh, before I end, I would welcome all of you for our synapse, which speaks on these interventions. So we would be having that on 27th and 28th of March. And uh, this is one interesting picture before I conclude. This is from the same book which I showed you. And it says that uh, if you think back to the toys and clothing you played with and wore in your youth, do you think that they were more result of your hormonal activity? Or do you think that they were choices that the society and the parents make for you? So thank you for the patient listening.